Hello, welcome to another session of Digital Surgical Pathology Slide Review and Sign Out. I'm Dr. Lewis Hassel, our program part of the Digital Anatomic Pathology Academy, a joint venture of Digital Pathology Association and PATH presenter. Um, we'll begin our uh, program today uh, thinking about uh, one particular uh, case that recently came to our attention. Um, and this uh, patient uh, was a 63-year-old uh, woman who had uh, been hospitalized or come to the emergency room about five times in the past two years, often with uh, chest pain or other complaints. She had some musculoskeletal pains, uh, sometimes lower back, sometimes legs. Um, she had uh, supposedly a diagnosis of COPD, and somewhere along the line uh, in her chart, it said lupus. So uh, with that complex history, um, she had uh, a CT scan, which showed some nodules in her lung in addition to the COPD changes. And that prompted concern for malignancy and referral to an oncologist. And you know, the, the diagnostic workout pr proceeded. Well, part of that was a PET scan, uh, which lighted up uh, at the base of her tongue. And so she got to see a head and neck uh, specialist uh, as well. So uh, this brings up, uh, I think, a fairly common and not very often discussed challenge in medicine, which is the patient who has this long, serpiginous history, multiple complaints, often without definitive diagnosis or uh, something that unifies and uh, really rectifies the patient's circumstances. Multiple abnormal test results, multiple diagnoses, uh, multiple systems involved, and in consequence, multiple physician consultants. If you look at hemochromatosis or amyloidosis, for example, 49% uh, or more will have seen four or more physicians, often over a period of uh, one to three years uh, prior to a definitive diagnosis being rendered. Uh, that's not really a great performance on the part of the medical system. So uh, what happened with this patient? Well, here are the biopsies from the base of the tongue. You can see we have a squamous mucosa here, and I apologize for the uh, scanning lines. Uh, the squamous mucosa looks uh, unremarkable. There's some lymphoid tissue here. And then we've got these little uh, nests and aggregates of uh, very eosinophilic uh, tissue. Um, and of course, if we were looking at a pelvic lymph node, you might think, well, this is just TAM horseball protein. Uh, but in the upper air digestive tract, this is uh, not particularly common to find this sort of hyalinized um, uh, eosinophilic uh, material, uh, very sparse in cellularity. Uh, and as you can see, not really a fibrillar or collagenous type of background, but very amorphous. So uh, my colleague who saw this case uh, uh, astutely ordered a Congo red stain, uh, which we see here. Um, and uh, not surprisingly, uh, these uh, eosinophilic uh, hyalinized areas are uh, quite uh, congophilic. Now, uh, the Congo red stain is useful in uh, making the diagnosis of amyloidosis, but purely congophilia does not necessarily make uh, the diagnosis of amyloidosis. Uh, so in order to do that, uh, polarized light exam is useful, uh, it, at which time you can see this very nice uh, uh, birefringent uh, uh, color of sort of apple green as you move the condenser, rotate the condenser uh, and the compensator. Uh, so uh, this is uh, not a challenging diagnosis, but sometimes if you don't have the equipment, and obviously we can't do this with a digital slide, um, uh, you may not be uh, fully aware of the diagnosis or keyed into it. Note that uh, other collagen will uh, have a birefringent as fringent, uh, pattern as well, but it's usually this yellow uh, pattern of normal collagen. Um, and uh, you wanna see a predominance of the greenish uh, uh, color. Uh, in m most of the literature, this is described as sort of an apple green uh, color. So that confirms the diagnosis of amyloid, uh, amyloid deposition, and therefore probably systemic amyloidosis. Um, 
Uh, and it brings up the question of how do we usually make this diagnosis? Well, I would say traditionally um, at the time of uh, diagnosis uh, that uh, the uh, use of a fat pad biopsy is uh, most commonly uh, the, the method of choice, uh, least invasive, uh, least painful, and uh, fairly high diagnostic yield. But um, when we're not thinking of that diagnosis, we may get biopsies of other areas and any of these mucosal sites uh, in the upper air digestive tract, uh, urinary bladder, and occasionally even in the uh, anogenital or GI tract, uh, you can uh, uh, also localize uh, these proteins if you're looking for them and thinking about that possibility. They may not be nodular deposits like we saw here in the uh, uh, lingual tonsil. Um, other uh, sites that can be removed, uh, oftentimes, or, or biopsied, cardiac biopsies, tenosynovium is a classic one, uh, and of course, liver and kidney uh, also can be included as areas where you may get um, uh, samples that could be diagnostic. As we think about amyloidosis, it's important to recognize that it's not a single disease, that there are actually uh, several subtypes. Uh, commonly, we have uh, AL or light, light chain amyloidosis, uh, which occurs at about 12 patients per million people per year. Uh, and, but the more frequent one is the amyloid transthyretin, uh, which uh, occurs at approximately 190 cases per million people per year, but has several different variants. Uh, and so ha having identified amyloid in this patient, the next steps would be probably peptide sequencing or other me methods to uh, clarify whether this is a light chain uh, phenomenon, uh, secondary amyloidosis, or whether this is primary amyloidosis and one of the ATTR uh, variants that may occur in uh, various genetic predispositions. Um, this is challenging because sometimes there is overlap uh, and sometimes ATTR patients can have uh, light chain uh, as well in their backdrop. The other thing uh, to think about is that uh, besides a tissue, there are other methods of uh, diagnosis or imputing the diagnosis, including various uh, evaluation of uh, immune globulins, uh, either via immunofixation or just a gross measurement uh, in the serum. Uh, additionally, cardiac amyloid uh, can oftentimes be identified or imputed uh, based on uh, associated echocardiography or MR. Um, and uh, once that is suggested, there are actually uh, uh, nuclear medicine scans using te technetium pyrophosphate um, to identify uh, the appropriate deposition and uptake, uptake patterns that are considered diagnostic uh, in the presence either of a monoclonal gam gammopathy or even without. Uh, additionally, um, sometimes bone marrow biopsy um, or evaluation of uh, other serologic tests. Um, mass spectrometry uh, on the tissue uh, can be completed in certain settings. Uh, and this is generally preferred uh, once you have made the diagnosis via tissue. Uh, so getting that tissue sent off to an appropriate location where the amyloid can be uh, characterized and typed uh, is useful. Uh, rarely, uh, we need to uh, perform germline DNA testing to detect some of the hereditary variants um, as opposed to the wild type uh, disorders. Uh, this is nicely summarized in this JAMA reference from last year, um, if you'd like to refer to that. Well, thank you for joining me. This is uh, the final sign out diagnosis today is uh, systemic amyloidosis involving the upper airway brucosa and the mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue uh, still pending uh, the protein evaluation on this patient to determine subtyping. Appreciate you spending your time with me on this case today, and uh, please uh, don't hesitate to send feedback. Uh, we appreciate uh, the chance to uh, connect with uh, you. Uh, also, uh, hit that subscribe button so you can catch future releases uh, from our channel. And uh, so until next time, uh, thanks so much for, short, for joining me. It's been a great pleasure to be with you, and I look forward to seeing you again.